Gray light, shifting and swirling, dominates your vision. You move, but not by physical exertion, but through sheer force of will. You feel as though you move through mud, slowly and inefficiently. You hear whispers and spy shapes moving in your peripheral. Images from other worlds, other planes. They move slowly, their voices muffled as if viewed through water. You embark on your journey, unsure of what you might find. Everything around you seems familiar, yet strangely alien. You feel as though nothing has any weight, and as you pass familiar sights, you find them just beyond your ability to fully perceive. You wonder why it seems to take longer to travel the same distance, but then you suddenly see your destination before you. What I just read to you in regards to the ethereal realm and planar travel can be found on Describe.com, the sponsor for this video. Describe is a website where you can search for any D&D spell, monster, or D&D related location and receive a detailed, professionally written, boxed text that you can then read to your players. You know, if you have your players find themselves in a blue dragon's lair and and you're unsure how to describe it, or you want some help to enhance your own description, you can simply head on over to the website, type in dragon on the search bar, and you will get tons of different options for descriptors that refer to dragons. As you can see here, you have a description for a copper dragon, a dragon town, there's a descriptor for a young blue dragon, but going further down, you see that they also have one for an ancient blue dragon. So they have descriptors for specific dragon ages, but also a different descriptor for the lair of said dragons. You can do this exact same search, for spells and items. I mean, most things that can be described could be found here. Again, written by professional writers who understand and play the game themselves. I have partnered with Describe and their excellent resources, so from now on, on my videos, you will see me use them a lot to describe some of the locations that I cover at the beginning of the video, just how I did it for this one. Uh, their, their stuff is just really good, so I'm glad to be able to do that. If you want to take advantage of this as well, then head on over to Describe.com slash Rex. That is D S. S C R Y B dot com slash Rex. There's a bunch of content for free in there that you can access, but if you pay the premium, then you get access to all of the thousands and thousands of descriptors that they've got. If you do, make sure that you do it with the coupon code Rex at checkout to save yourself some extra money. But now, back to the ethereal realm. So let's see, how exactly am I going to tackle this video? The, the topic is massive, and I shouldn't skip much either since most people don't know much about this particular plane. I suppose I should start with why you should actually care. The reason I feel the ethereal realm gets typically brushed over to the side is because there frankly isn't much of a reason to ever go here. I mean, the only way a DM or a player would ever get to truly interact with it typically would be either through a ghost or through the spell ethereal. Realness. But even then, the spell is so high level that most adventures won't even get high enough to the point where you will be able to pick it. And quite frankly, 99% of players that deal with ghosts do so on the material plane, not on the ethereal. They would probably just wait for the ghost to materialize itself to deal with it. So why should you care about the ethereal? Well, you should because you use it actually more than you realize it. I'm of the sound belief that the more people understand it, the more likely that they will interact with it. And there is so much to interact with, so in what ways can you interact with it? Well, for starters, your dreams. This one might come as a shocker for you, but when you dream, you actually are in the ethereal realm. If you cast the spell Dream, what you're actually doing is you're finding the dreamer in the ethereal realm and invading his personal private sanctum, and then, of course, manipulating it. Second, demiplanes are also on the ethereal, so any spell that creates a demiplane directly creates that piece of land or building on a floating ether of the ethereal. Thirdly, whenever you or your adventuring party is ever contacted by more than one god and your DM creates a visual scene of you seeing the gods, that would also take place in the ethereal. There's actually a fun set of scenes in Pillars of Eternity 2, one of my favorite games, where the characters talk to all of the different gods in a mysterious kind of foggy plane. Well, in the ND, that would be the ethereal. And then fourthly, well, I already mentioned it, but ghosts. Ghosts are actually not invisible. If they were, 
were, then technically you could interact with them perfectly by just touching them like any invisible person. Instead, they reside in the border ethereal. Understanding what exactly is that and how it works will make all of your interactions with those monsters all the better. Okay, so there it is. Now that we know why we should care, let's start with what is the ethereal realm? So for most wizards and scholars, their answer to this question would be, well, the ethereal realm is a transitory plane. It is merely what is between the prime and the inner planes. In reality, it is a bit more complicated because the realm is far greater than, than just simply merely a road. If the inner planes hold all of the elemental building blocks of the multiverse, then the ethereal realm holds all the potentiality of the multiverse. Quote, infinite in depth and containing within it as yet unrealized space and matter, end quote. The ethereal realm is like the bowl that holds all of the physical reality, but more so than just a container, it is also a propagator, quote, the ethereal is in some ways like a murky pool laden with dissolved elements. A ripple on its surface is sometimes enough to cause a blob of solid ether to crystallize, possibly forming a seed for demiplane growth. It's the mists and fogs themselves that are the visual sign of the dissolved elements constantly streaming forth from the inner planes." End quote. We are talking now about the metaphysical understanding of how the D&D worlds work now. The inner planes, those being the, the plane of fire, the plane of water, earth and air and others, they embody physical reality. They are the concrete building blocks of everything that is real. You can combine every single one of those elements of the inner planes and then, well, form limitless worlds and creation. If you have fire, earth, water and air, you can basically create anything. Well, then it is the ethereal plane that has the purpose of actually combining and then mixing those elemental building blocks. This is why all the material worlds border the ethereal. It all started from here. Quote, one could view the mists of the ethereal as potential matter, unresolved but full of possibility. This is because the ethereal vapors are made out of tendrils, each with the potential of earth, air, fire, water, and mixtures of elemental material. Thus, all matter on the ethereal plane is gas-like and flush with possibility. When the waves of potential reality collide, they form solid ether and demiplanes, end quote. All right, so that's the fundamental place of the ethereal plane in existence. But now, practically speaking, how does one actually get to interact with such a place? First, it is important to understand that for the purposes of adventuring, there are actually two ethereal planes, what we call the border ethereal and the deep ethereal. The border ethereal is what you first access whenever you try and reach the ethereal. In this place, you're essentially simultaneously on both planes at the same time. You exist in, in a form of in-between, that is, in between the material and the ethereal. This is the place that most people are actually accustomed to and the place where ghosts and apparitions would dwell. I use this analogy a lot, but the border ethereal would look very much like when Frodo puts on the One Ring, where everything just looks fairly normal except that it's foggy and with grayish color tones, and it allows him to see things that might otherwise be unseen. The main difference, though, is that interaction between the border ethereal and the material plane can be quite challenging. First of all, vision while on the border is fairly limited. Typically, you can't see anything past 60 feet on a particular sunny day or well-illuminated area. If the area is not illuminated well at all, then it is possible for this range to drop down all the way down to even 15 feet of visual range. You also can't hear things very well coming from the real world. It has been described as attempting to listen to someone speak while underwater. You can kind of make out very emphatic statements like help or look out, but Anything more complex than that would basically be impossible. On the other side though, attempting to interact with something on the material plane 
from the ethereal is it's mostly impossible. The general rule of thumb is that someone from the material can interact with you on the ethereal but with great difficulty, whereas you on the ethereal cannot interact at all with those on the material. As you can have the, the most badass and intense boss battle on the ethereal realm with explosions and screams and, and beams and magic spells being thrown around and people could be just walking around on the material side without anyone even hearing or noticing anything. And this is why interacting with a ghost can be very interesting and mostly challenging. A ghost can only see you if you are fairly close, and they can understand you too, but only if you speak in very short and very emphatic sounding words. Whereas nothing that the ghost does on the ethereal will be known to you or felt by you. They could be speaking their hearts out and you would not hear a thing. Now, ghosts do work a bit different from normal adventurers in the border because ghosts have the special ability to, at will, materialize and dematerialize after that. So they can play around a little bit with the rules, they can come in and out of the border basically at will. But this is why you don't need anything special to attack a ghost that is trying to attack you. You can hurt them with your normal weapons because they have chosen to materialize on the material plane, so the at that point are basically as real as you and I. But while they are on the ethereal, however, well, that's an entirely different story. See, a person or monster on the border ethereal can pass through most things, which means they cannot be hurt by most things. Even if you see a ghost or someone else on the border ethereal, say with like a, a spell like True Sight or Sea Invisibility, if you were to try and strike at it with your Firebolt spell or with a normal sword attack, you actually wouldn't do anything. Those things will simply pass through the creature. This is actually one of the greater benefits of going into the border ethereal. Being able to pass through solid objects like stone or elements like water, fire, or even magma. That can be very useful. The restrictions, however, are very specific and very useful to know. A person or monster on the border ethereal cannot pass through living tissue or very dense materials. And now these rules are changed every so often, but once again, I want to note that we are using the Great Wheel cosmology model, and hence, we're going by Planescape rules, which means a ghost or a person on the ethereal plane cannot pass through living tissue. Obviously, unless they have a special ability to do so. Anyways, living tissue is pretty straightforward, everyone knows what that means. Uh, basically, you can't pass through people. Now, the concept of very dense materials, on the other hand, can be a tad more difficult to nail down. The general rule is that anything more dense than lead will prevent a person on the border ethereal to be able to pass through it. Lead has a density of 11.4 grams per cubic centimeter. This means that to a person on the border ethereal, something as dense as lead will feel to them like a wall or a solid object. Other materials which would also feel like a wall to them at this point would be gold and platinum, which are actually considered some of the more dense materials in the world. To put it into perspective, gold has a density of 19.32 grams per cubic centimeter, while platinum having a bit more than that at 21. 45. As a dungeon master, I, I would also allow silver to be a wall against ethereal traveler, not just because in the mythos silver has always hurt ghosts, we all know that, but also because they are almost as dense as lead, sitting at 10.49 grams per cubic centimeter, so it, it just makes sense, it's basically almost like lead. Anyways, these numbers matter not just because if you want to protect your dungeon or chest from ethereal snatchers, you might want to coat it with these elements, but also because if you're hoping to attack something on the ethereal realm, then coating your weapons with these materials might actually do the trick. A gold or platinum weapon could technically strike at a person on the border ethereal since they cannot pass through it. Though, if you don't have access to unreal amounts of money in order to make that happen, then force damage is known to also do the trick. Ethereal travelers can pass through any element except for force. A wall of force on the material plane will prevent a border ethereal traveler from passing, and in the same vein, a spell that does force damage should also technically be able to harm them. Now, I, I say technically because according to Jeremy Crawford, who designs the rules for D&D, he said in a tweet that you in fact could not hurt an ethereal creature with force damage, but yeah, technically it would make sense that if force damage becomes a wall to you, then a wall moving really fast towards you and striking you would hurt you, but I suppose one can reach the argument that the different elements of force are indeed different forces. 
or something. Anyways, on the other hand, there's typically nothing that a person or monster in the border ethereal can do to you from there, unless, of course, they have a special ability to do so. Just how night hacks, for example, can haunt your dreams from there. Now, when it comes to types of magic, abjuration spells tend to affect those on the ethereal realm. Spells that protect and ward seem to be particularly powerful in this regard, and they seem to carry on these effects over into the ethereal. If you are an ethereal traveler and you're traveling through a dungeon or a wizard's tower, you should always be careful of glyphs of warning, whose effects will most certainly activate and damage you, even in the ethereal realm. Spells like Dispel Magic and Anti-Magic Fields are particularly dangerous to you because they will take you out of your ethereal form and jaunt you back into the prime. A very dangerous process if you're not ready because if you face back into reality inside of a wall, well, you're dead. Lastly, outside of magic and special ores, there actually is a mundane concoction that one can make that would prevent ethereal travel into your domain. That is Gorgon's Blood. If you combine Gorgon's Blood with the mortar of your building, it will function as a wall on the ethereal plane. Very interesting stuff. Oh, and remember that the Gorgon in D&D is a metal bowl, not a medusa. Uh, that gets confused a lot. Though I should mention, medusas are definitely part of the conversation here. Most spells and abilities do not work against those on the ethereal, but the medusa's eyes do. All you have to do is gaze at the medusa's eyes, and even from the ethereal, you will be turned to stone. This also applies with basilisks and cockatrices who can see into the ethereal and petrify you. Now, movement in the border ethereal is quite simple. You can use whatever form of travel you typically use and it should work over there. If you have legs, you can just walk. If you have wings, you can simply fly. It all works. However, you can also simply just will yourself to move and you will move. If you merely think about flying up into the air, you will do so. Even if you don't have any wings, if you wish yourself to burrow under the floor, you can do that as well. If things happen this way because the border ethereal is a combination of the prime material world and of the ethereal. You're combining the laws of gravity from the planet you come from and the rules of movement from the ethereal plane. This process of combining these two factors is important because if there is a specific magical or logical law of nature from your plane that is special and different from the norm, it will most likely also be incorporated into its border ethereal. For example, the border ethereal of the plane of fire can still burn you. Now, to finish off this video, we will talk about how to leave the border ethereal and enter the deep ethereal. Then, on our next episode, we will basically invest it all into just talking about the deep, because that's, that's a whole other kind of worms. So, from the border, literally all you have to do is will yourself into the deep. There actually isn't much to it at all. A movement in the ethereal is all about willpower and knowledge of where you are going, and entering the deep is really just not that much different. Quote, a body on the border who witnesses someone else leaving the border for the deep sees the traveler suddenly obscured in a royal of multicolored mists that finally boil away into nothingness, leaving no sign of the traveler." End quote. When a person does this and enters the deep ethereal, they will notice themselves floating in a realm free of the features that they were accustomed to before. A realm of floating mists, and behind them from where they came from, just a vast, undulating curtain of vaporous color. Quote, this wall of color represents the boundary between the deep ethereal and the border. If a body immediately decides to leave the deep ethereal, she can will herself back through the curtain, traveling to the exact same spot on the border from which she originated. If a traveler moves along the curtain a distance before re-entering the border, she will find herself in a different part of the border." End quote. The thing to keep in mind here is that distances in the deep ethereal are all subjective. Traveling for five minutes along along the curtain one time will not yield the same results as the next time you travel along the curtain for 5 minutes. All locations on the ethereal are not relative to each other and completely subjective to your perception. 
Now, this wall of color pertains to the border to your world, but not the border to other worlds. You will have to travel into the deep and find other walls of color to join in other realms. Now, this wall of color is only visible from the deep ethereal. If you are in the border ethereal, you cannot see it. Instead, you would see the world that you're currently bordering. But what particularly makes that wall of color cool is that it not just functions as a gate to the world from the outside, but it is also a plane in in and out of itself. In fact, it is inside that wall of color where the world of dreams is located. This world is typically non-accessible. You, you can't just go in and manipulate it unless you have powerful spells and abilities that would allow you to do that. Once again, like the night hags that can haunt it or magic like the fifth level illusion spell dream. So how does it work? See, the shimmering wall of color that forms the door into your world from the ethereal is actually a reflection of reality, of the reality of the plane. When an entity dreams, a portion of her inner being resonates with this reflection. Quote, this dream persona simultaneously maintains a connection with the physical body and with the dream occurring beyond the veil of sleep analogous to the way an ethereal traveler exists both on the border and an adjacent plane simultaneously. Only dreamers can pass beyond the veil of sleep and enter the dream plane that exists within the wall." End quote. Now, inside this color wall that we will now call the veil of sleep, many separate and private dreams unfold all the time, though you can't see any of them from the outside. Now, typically, there's nothing nefarious, there's nothing weird going on in this plane of dreams, and for the most part, uh, whatever happens in there will only, if anything, change the mood of the participant only a bit upon waking up. Like, there's never anything crazy dramatic in there. But if you have the right abilities, in particular if you're a powerful psionic, you can then move into the curtain and participate in the various dreams of other people along the way. Though there is always danger. If you encounter a dream of particular clarity and lucidity, things could indeed then hurt you. In any case, these realms and worlds would cease to exist the second a person wakes, unless it is being maintained through some great magic or via godly power, like when a god sends prophetic visions to his cleric. Now, sometimes dark gods and dark magic can keep a particular nefarious nightmare realm open for its evil purposes, like what you might find in the nightmare lands of Ravenloft. But yeah, I bet you didn't expect to find this on a video about ethereal travel, but I suppose let's go ahead and talk about dreaming. Quote, sleeping characters manifest dream selves that move through the mental landscape of the dream plane. These dream selves are reflections of reality and are much like the character's true selves. End quote. While dreaming, your strength is equal to your wisdom and your dexterity is equal to your intelligence. But typically everything else would stay the same unless you're a bard, at which point you basically get bonuses to everything. The lore literally describes that because bards have great creativity and mental acuity, they become basically super strong whenever they are dreaming. Now, here's the part that I know you have been waiting for. If you die in your dreams, do you die in real life? Kind of. If you're reduced to less than half your hit points in your dream world, you're expected to do a saving throw when you wake up, and if you fail, you permanently lose points in intelligence. If you take more than just half your hit points, and depending on the severity of the damage and the extent of the psychological trauma, you could then end up in a coma, in madness, or even in death in some of the most extreme cases. But uh, there it is, we covered the border ethereal and how to enter the deep ethereal. On the next video we will cover the full extent of the deep ethereal, which, man, it's like a whole other thing. You can have an entire campaign just simply set in the deep. This thing is massive and shock full of lore. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Barry Mascant, 5e Magic Shop, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Biotechnofrag, Doc Feeder, Brad Salazar, Walker Motley, Terry Culp, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Ozol, Alex Cookson, Stephen, Falky951, 
Benjamin Bosters, Thomas Hunt, Prince Daylight, Morning Crown, Sabim Kurshab, Solarensis, Ordoric, Nathan McComb, Silent Shoppa, Bushido Burrito, Werewolven Games, Soulless Rider, Roleplay with Advantage, Mr. Salty, Stalia, Lost Crusader, Tython, Trev909, Garrett Minnick, JD Green, Tony Arzi, Famin52, George Fortland, Olaf Klepp, Trevor Hess, Sovereign Mind, Dreg Logia5, Who Stewart, Zeran King, The Living Guild Pack, Michael Walker, and Streblo for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. All right, guys, next video is going to be on the deep, so look out for that. It should be out in just about like a day or two. I, I made these two videos simultaneously so that they would come out basically almost together. So it shouldn't take me too long to upload the next one. So see you all there. Bye-bye.